everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So as we're in unit two, economic and personal finance, talking about uh, micro and macro economics, yesterday I uh, gave an overview of macroeconomics. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about microeconomics. And as the name implies, micro means small, uh, looking at a much smaller version of economics than macroeconomics yesterday. Microeconomics is gonna look at uh, like specific businesses, or as they're called in economics, firms. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So today we're focusing on microeconomic basics. Like I said, yesterday we had been talking about macroeconomics. Today it is microeconomics. So what is microeconomics? Uh, this is the definition, is the study of how individual actors make choices in response to change in incentives, prices, resources, and or methods or production. What? All right, so uh, in economics, they like to use kind of catch-all phrases that aren't used in normal language that might seem confusing, but it's really not. Like when they talk about businesses, because there's all different types of businesses and does this counteract as a business or whatever, like maybe, maybe not. They use the term firms a lot of time in economics to just represent businesses. Also, how individual actors, the reason they use the word actors are not actual actors here when they're talking about economics. Uh, they use the term actors a lot in, in economics when they're talking about uh, like people or things that influence something. Uh, like, so you could have a person could be an actor and they could mess with the economics in their household of how they budget their own money. That's microeconomics. It could be a business of how they manipulate their own money so that they uh, uh, can make a profit and they would both be considered an actor. So it's a simple term just to talk about the thing that is uh, in charge of making the money decisions, whether it's an individual person in a household, a corporation, a CEO, a president. So when you see firms, that pretty much refers to businesses. Actors just uh, uh, generally refers to uh, whoever's making the decisions as it comes to money. So goes back to it. What is microeconomics and specifically uh, uh, what does it do? So microeconomics, all right, and we had talked about this in the first unit, deals a lot more with that supply and demand. It's on a much smaller scale, talking about like an individual company having to decide how to manage your money. They're making a product, they're trying to sell it. Where do we need to be selling it at? Like what's the demand for it? Uh, and you can see it in this little graph here, uh, that little circle in the middle, that, if you remember from the first unit, that's the equilibrium. That's where uh, the supply and demand graphs uh, uh, cross each other. That is the point of how much you should sell your products for. Uh, so to clarify here, make sure we're all on the same page, what is the difference in macro and microeconomics? So macro, large scale. Macro, we talked about yesterday, this is talking about the entire country's economy. And we're going to talk a lot about, uh, uh, well, we did talk about yesterday, macroeconomic indicators, stuff like the unemployment rate, interest rates, inflation. These types of things are big indicators on how the economy is, is doing uh, on a huge, large scale, like an entire country. Microeconomics looks at basically uh, the financial success or lack thereof of like individual companies all the way down to like uh, household budgets. So much, much smaller. A lot of things in microeconomics don't necessarily impact the larger picture of like other companies and businesses. Uh, if that was the case, that would be more macroeconomics. So microeconomics looks at one individual business or firm, all right, uh, and basically uh, deciphers how financially successful they are, all right? And there are indicators for microeconomics, just like there are macroeconomics, that helps determine whether or not a firm is being uh, successful or not in the microeconomic sphere. So the question here is, what is microeconomics and how is it different from macroeconomics? So pause me, answer that completely, and we're moving on. All right, so as we're looking at economic indicators here, all right, uh, in the microeconomic phase of things, 
Uh, one of the biggest indicators, all right, for uh, microeconomics is production, all right? So uh, basically, uh, if a company is producing a lot, all right, that is typically a good thing, all right? If you're not producing a lot, that's typically a bad thing. So the biggest indicator here of production is how much are you producing? All right, can you keep up with demand? So this is a picture of Apple uh, iPhone sales. So Apple, that is, uh, you would use microeconomic uh, uh, ideas uh, in order to judge whether or not Apple is being successful. And a big part of that is its production. If a company is not increasing production over time, they're probably not growing as a company. So brings us to two very, very important words that you're going to hear. They sound like they're interchangeable, but they're not. All right. Those two words in economics that you will hear all the time that again, sound like they're interchangeable, but they're not is economic expansion and economic growth. Both of those sound like they're getting bigger and you would be correct. Both of those sound like, the economy is getting larger and you would be correct even on a macro scale or a micro scale economic expansion and growth both mean they're getting bigger and they both sound like they would be good things and you're correct you're like okay mr Y, except then how is economic expansion and economic uh growth different well here's how all right so the sparks notes of this all right is economic growth is long-term economic expansion is short-term. Here's how I remember it. Say I go out, all right, and I've been trying, trying to stay on a diet, all right, and I go out to a buffet and I eat a ton. My belly is going to expand, all right, because I put a lot in it, all right? Uh, however, if I go back to my diet and everything works out like and go back to normal, my belly will go back to its normal size. All right, so that's expansion, it's short term. However, if I went to that same buffet every single day and ate that much, I would get fat, er, fatter. I'm, I'm not skinny. Uh, so I would get fatter, all right, and uh, that would be growth, all right? My belly would grow to accommodate the constant expansion that I was putting in my belly. Right? And it would grow and, I, and, and, and my stomach would get bigger uh, and that would be growth. So growth is a long-term expansion and short-term. So here on like the economic cycle, it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and down. Those short green areas here, those are expansion. All right? However, if you took from the very left side of this graph, uh, from the very left side of the graph, uh, and then you connected it with the right side of the graph, uh, and you basically put a point from the start of where this line went and the other one in a straight line and it went in a diagonal line up. From that line would represent growth across both the average of both of those green sections. So economic growth is long term. Economic expansion is short term. Neither are bad. All right. However, growth really talks about uh, you've added infrastructure and that you can maintain this expansion for a longer period of time. All right. Uh, so, uh, but production is the economic indicator that we're talking about here. Uh, and production helps, um, helps economists understand if a firm is in um, a, a long period of growth, mainly because uh, if they remain in expansion a long enough time, they, they'll be become growth. Expanding basically just means that you're hitting on all cylinders and you're max producing as much as you can. Growth is going to mean you've added like another addition to your warehouse to up your production. That would be growth. Adding that addition onto your factory in order to make more stuff, that would be growth. So production and sales really help as a microeconomic indicator uh, understand if good things are happening like expansion or growth. So the question here is how do production and sales help economists determine whether we're we in a state of economic expansion or recession, which is a term that we will talk about in this unit quite a bit, recessions and depressions. Uh, so a recession would be the opposite of an expansion. 
all right, uh, that, that it is uh, deteriorating, that you are not selling as much as you once were, uh, and, and you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, so pause me, answer that completely, and we're moving on. So another economic indicator here at the micro level is prices. Rising prices. Oh, rising prices, Mr. Wagstaff. We talked about this yesterday. Rising prices is bad. Is it? Uh, yes, Mr. Wagstaff. We talked about this a lot yesterday. Rising prices is bad. Why is it bad? Calls, Mr. Wagstaff, like we said yesterday in macroeconomics, you said rising prices means that there's probably inflation taking place. It, this is not inflation. It is not inflation. This is a lot of times macro and microeconomics completely separate things and you can't really confuse them. Prices can be confusing uh, if you don't think about, if you're talking about it in the microeconomic aspect or the macro. Macro prices go up all over the country. That's bad because that probably means that the value of the dollar is going down, inflation, all this other stuff. When you look at one individual company or firm, all right, and those prices start going up, that could just be that there's more demand for their product because demand goes up, price goes up. If demand goes down, price goes down. Uh, inflation is a macroeconomic indicator, not a microeconomic indicator. Uh, so rising prices in micro is good because you're just looking at one company. If the price of these products are going up in just one company, all right, that could mean that there's a lot of demand for that product and you can increase profits, which we'll talk about here in a second. So rising prices in microeconomics is good. Macro, not so good because that would affect everybody. So it's not inflation, all right? Uh, so when prices are going up for a company, like, hey, you're, you're sitting here creating a product and then all of a sudden demand goes up, that most likely means that demand or uh, demand goes up, prices are going to go up, all right? And you probably have, have less of the supply, you have to increase growth. Uh, you may have to add another addition to your factory in order to keep up with, uh, with demand because supply is low. There's all these indicators that if the price of a product is going up, that is that that company is probably doing good. So in microeconomics, the, inc uh, the increase of price of products just for one particular company probably indicates that that company is doing well, all right? Because if your company's not doing well and you increase the price of stuff, you're just gonna put yourself out of business. So from the outside looking in, uh, it's like iPhones iPhones cost like over a thousand dollars and they're not getting cheaper like the brand new ones. All right. Uh, as I say that, and since I'm recording this in 2023, I can date myself when I use technology as an example. So I realize that, uh, but, uh, based on the current market system, uh, you know, if nobody wanted to buy an iPhone at this point and they decided to like charge over a thousand dollars, that would be dumb because it's too expensive. Nobody wants it and they'd go out of business. The only reason they can charge so much for it is because people still want it. And that's a good indicator that Apple is doing well with their iPhones because the prices are high, uh, uh, because that is their evaluation of their market. So the question here is explain how prices are a real world indicator in microeconomics. Like what do prices show about the uh, success or lack thereof of a, of a company AKA a firm. So pause me, answer that completely. We're moving on. All right, profit. Well, Mr. Wagstaff, we've already talked about prices. Like if prices go up, that's a good thing, right? So it's the same thing as profit. Well, you, you might completely understand this already. However, you might not. We need to be very clear on what profit is, what costs are, and uh, what the uh, uh, you know the cost in, incurred by the buyer and the supplier. So, profit is the financial benefit realized when revenue generated from a business activity exceeds the cost involved in sustaining the activity in question. Any questions? All right. 
Uh, sometimes uh, they try to make it as difficult as possible. This is really not a, a difficult concept. They word it fancily, right, in terminology that we don't always use. So sometimes I'm like, what is this? So here's what it is. Say this stack of money here uh, is going to people are making a, a cup, right? You got a cup, right? So say that cup, all right, cost $10 to make. So that middle stack here, money paid to suppliers, all right, that is how much it cost the cup company to buy those cups or have them made is $10. Then that stack on the left is what they sell it for. Say that they sell it for $12, all right? So the profit that they make, the only actual money that they put in their pocket is $2, and that's that uh, one on the far right, that means that uh, you're only making $2 profit and that is what is measured. So if the cost of your cups go up and you have to increase your prices, all of a sudden the, the cups are $15 and you have to increase your, uh, you know, the cost of the cup to $16, everybody thinks you're making $16 off of every cup. When in actuality, if you bought it for $15 and you're selling it for $16, you're actually now only making a $1 profit and your profits are, have actually gone down. So profit is a much better indicator of a, the success of a firm than just the cost of, um, uh, of what they're selling. So typically the higher profit margins are on the things that are in high demand. The super high demand products, all right, uh, this is on Amazon, but the super high demand products typically have a higher profit margin meaning that uh, uh, things that have um, high demand mean there's low supply. Like a trading card might be worth a quarter, but all of a sudden it is a super rare trading card, which means that supply is low and then there's a lot of people that want it. So demand is high. And then instead of only being worth 25 cents, it could be worth like, you know, $200. And uh, because of that, uh, there's a huge profit margin, all right? So demand, all right, typically when demand is high, obviously prices are high, but what is increasing the prices when demand goes up is typically that sweet spot of profit. So if demand is high, not only do prices go up, but what is making the price increase is that profit gap that the company that is selling it is actually making pure profit off of it. So when demand is high, profit is higher. So the, that's what the question is here. How are demand and profitability related in microeconomics? So pause me, answer that completely, and we're moving on. All right, here's another economic indicator on is a company doing well or not, all right? Is a firm successful? And it deals with wages, all right? So not only wages is your salary, all right, uh, but there's a lot of other versions of wages. But uh, in microeconomics, we talk specifically about wages in general, but wages can be your salary wages, it can be your hourly wages, overtime wages, retroactive pay, commissions, bonus pay, severance pay, occurred time off pay, tip wages. Basically, any money that an employee receives from a business for working there is considered wages, all right? So this is a very indicative, all right, because it's an indicator uh, over whether or not a company or industry is doing well or not, all right? If the employees are getting paid well, there is clearly a growth potential in that, uh, in that job, in that field, in that firm. So uh, I thought this was interesting. The highest paid job in every state. All right, uh, almost all of them, hold on. Yep, all of them is in the medical profession, all right? Uh, so the medical field is doing well. In a microeconomic sense, I mean, the fact that the doctors uh, in all of these fields make a lot of money 
show you that the not only is the uh, field of medicine doing well, but when they have the ability to pay their workers this much, that there's probably a high level of profitability there because a lot of the uh, money that you use to pay wages comes from profitability. So when you pay your workers a lot of money, that is a strong indicator that your um, firm is doing well. Here, not really surprising, it is going to be uh, in medicine. So I also thought, hey, what's the lowest paying jobs in each state? Uh, in North Carolina, where I'm filming this right now, is a fast food cooks. Uh, uh, a lot of, lot of uh, food prep and serving, waitresses, servers. Um, if you see gaming dealers, what is that? Is that like people that are on like uh, Twitch, like or the, the, the YouTube gamers? The gaming dealers are like people that do blackjack uh, and, and gambling casinos and things like that. Uh, pay, paid very, very low. But you're like, but casinos have so much money. Their profit margins are not nearly as high as you think it would be. Uh, and therefore, they're not paying the, uh, the table dealers as much. Just like uh, fast food cooks, people that work at Wendy's and McDonald's, they don't make a ton of money because those places don't make a huge profit. People go to fast food because it's cheap. So fast food restaurants have a hard time paying higher wages because they don't have a lot of profit on their food. There's a big push to pay fast food workers more, which if these companies do that, since there's so many workers there, it will cause uh, the price of food to go up and people may not go to fast food as much if it's just as expensive as going to a restaurant with a waiter or a waitress. And then, you know, they'd have to lay off. It's, it's a whole, it's not simple what, when, when you look at uh, microeconomics over where that variable is. So if a place is paying their workers well, it is usually a sign that it is a strong, thriving business. Places that do not pay their workers very well. Uh, now, granted, McDonald's probably doesn't pay, pay their workers great, all right? I'm not saying, you know, maybe it's better than Burger King or Hardee's or something like that, but uh, uh, they are not paying their workers $80,000 a year. That doesn't mean McDonald's is struggling it's just divided up by the amount of workers they have to have and the expectations of that job. So uh, when a economy is doing really, really well, all right, and companies are making a lot of money because everybody's buying their products, they pay their workers more, historically. If the economy is doing bad and it's in a recession, all right, Typically, they don't pay their workers as much. So how much you pay your workers is typically indicative of how the economy is uh, going at the time. So like the question here, explain a possible cause for a company who has experienced an increase in employment and wages the previous year, all right? So maybe the company came out with a new product everybody wanted and everybody's buying it, so a lot more money's coming into the company, uh, demand is up so they can charge more for this new product, everybody's making a ton of money, so then they can turn around and start paying their workers more because they have a higher profit, uh, uh, pro a higher profit margin. So that is one example, but, but create your own example there, all right? Uh, so uh, answer this question completely. Um, that's what I got for you guys today. See you guys tomorrow.